recording. Okay. Hi, welcome everybody. Uh, welcome to uh, Vanbug for March 17th, 2021. And uh, I'll begin by uh, going through our uh, just schedule for today. So we are starting by just like some quick announcements and introducing the speakers. Then we'll have the student uh, talk, uh, which is for about 15 minutes. For the student talk, please leave your questions towards the end uh and uh to the to the end of the student talk and then we'll have our feature talk uh and then throughout the feature talk if you have questions please put them in the chat uh but if you want to like ask yourself the, your your question yourself or if you think you have a more on tangent question you can leave it also towards the end of the talk uh, and then after that we'll open uh for more informal chatting with our uh speakers so uh, just to remind everybody, uh, Vanbug is uh, thankful for our sponsors, especially the Graduate Studies in Bioinformatics program uh, at SFU and UBC uh, and uh, Genome BC, uh, Ecoscope uh, program at UBC, uh, the Canadian Bioinformatics workshops at bioinformatics.ca, uh, and uh, our Vancouver local Accelera and uh, Langara College uh, here also in Vancouver. Uh, and we would like to also remind everybody that, Van uh, that Vanbug is uh, affiliated with uh, ISCB, uh, Montreal uh, version of Vanbug, Monbug, and Toronto's Torbug. Uh, and uh, we're uh, soliciting uh, suggestions for speakers for our next season, starting, uh, starting uh, in September. So please, if you have any suggested speakers, go to our website. There is a suggested speaker box and there's a form that you can fill uh, telling us why you'd want the speaker and uh, why do you think they're a good fit for Vanbug. Uh, so with that, I would like to start by introducing our student uh, speaker, uh, Nicole Zhang. Uh, Nicole is a graduate student at uh, the Wasserman Lab here at UBC and uh, Nicole will be talking about a uh, novel cell-specific generative deep learning model. Uh, and I would like also to introduce our uh, featured uh, speaker, Dr. Dr. Michael uh, Hoffman. Uh, so it is my great honor to host today's speaker, uh, Dr. Michael Hoffman. Uh, Michael Hoffman's work has been truly instrumental in building our understanding of the functional annotation of the genome. And this is especially true of his genome annotation method segue, which was able to provide simplified interpretation of truly large and heterogeneous genomics data sets. And that was quite critical for the famous NIH ENCODE project. Uh, currently, Dr. Michael Hoffman is a principal investigator at the Princess Margaret Cancer Center in Ontario. And uh, he is an associate, associate member, uh, associate professor uh, in the departments of medical biophysics and computer science at the University of Toronto. Uh, he was named uh, CIHR new investigator and has won numerous awards, including the Ontario Early Researcher Award. Uh, currently, his work focuses on building predictive computational models to understanding the interactions between the genome, the epigenome, the phenotype, especially when it comes to the human cancer. Uh, so uh, with that, I will give the floor first to our student speaker. So if Nicole, you could uh, start sharing your screen. And as a reminder, please, if you have uh, questions, leave them towards the end of uh, Nicole's talk. So hello everyone, I'm Nicole and um, I'm from the Wasserman and Mostafa Avi lab. And um, so what I'm presenting today is stems from the single cell sequencing dilemma. So when you're interested in the tissue, say the brain, when you perform the single cell sequencing, the data you get are often, um, doesn't have a lot of the rare cell type signals and a lot of noise. So what if we can have this um, neural net that can basically amplify the signal and denoise the data? And um, so this is what prompted me to um, generate this um, novel GAN network. So to go into some background about what GAN is, um, it's a generative adversarial network. Um, it's based on game theory. 
So you have this um, generator and a discriminator. So you can think about it as a cop and criminal analogy in which that for the generator is trying to generate fake data um, and the discriminator is trying to catch the generator's fake data. And so the stable state that you would want to get in the end, it would be that the discriminator is unable to distinguish between the real and the fake data because the generator has reached um, a certain quality in the level of um, data that's being generated. And so GAN has done a lot of work, including um, style transformations. So given the style of the um, pictures on the vertical axis, you can transform the um, picture on the horizontal axis into different styles. And um, in addition, you have this um, image generation from very specific segments. So for those, it's trained on the cat. And you can see that um, from those edges, it's trained to learn on um, the cat ears, cat eyes, cat nose. And so um, inspired by that, my GAN network basically takes in cell type information for the generator and it generates cell type specific DNA sequences. And so for the discriminator, it's fed in cell type information as well as the DNA sequence to, it, to be able to learn what is the cell specific DNA sequences. And there's this um, external feedback network that um, basically helps the GAN to train along after a certain number of epoch. And so um, to test my model, I um, tested on the Biren lab um, mouse data and this is the mouse forebrain, um, single nucleus ataxic from E11.5 all the way to P postnatal zero. And you can see that there are several different types of cells. So the gray ones, um, RGGs, are um, retinoglial cells. And um, those are the precursors for the neurons. So you can see that their population is going down as, you, uh, as the mice forebrain matures. And the blue ones are excitatory. The green ones are inhibitory, which also increase um, as the mice brain matures. And um, EMP is erythroid myeloprogenitor. It's not really neuron related, but I think it's included in this um, tissue sample because the difficulty um, separating the forebrain tissues. And um, you can see also the astrocyte in orange here. And um, they have um, 15,000 nuclei in total. So um, it has a, there was a lot of challenge working with this data because of the noise level. Um, so when I pick um, randomly pick 6,400 peaks, to test for motif enrichment, there was actually none of the motif that was enriched from those motifs. And so what I had to do was to pick the um, number of peaks, 6,400 um, in total, that is that has the top number of cells that falls within that peak. So it's the least spurious of all to um, be able to generate this um, control set. And um, after processing, I basically have this um, set in which that some cells have a lot of unique peaks and some cells don't. And you can imagine that um, cells with a lot of unique peaks probably will have easier time to learn. Um, and the GAN is only given one or zero in terms of presence or absence in the cell and not the cell number. So the GAN has to be able to learn um, what signal is important um, for the um, cell types. And so there are um, different evaluation criteria to evaluate the sequence generated by the GAN. Um, so first, is, is it diverse? Um, and second, is it memorizing the training sequences? And third, uh, most important of all, the characteristics do match. So for the first two, um, I'm using BLAST for um, evaluating the criteria. And uh, for the diversity, I'm basically asking the question, do generate sequence look alike? Um, if they look alike, that would in indicate that the GAN has a mode collapse in which that it only generate the same sequence over and over. Um, whereas for memorization, I'm uh, asking the question, that does, does the GAN memorize the training samples? And so um, using BLAST, I basically compare the um, generate sequence to the test sequence to see if GAN has memorizing. Um, those training sequences. And so um, the BLAST parameters that I'm testing is just the alignment length. So if the alignment is very long, it would indicate that there is some memorization going on. Whereas if it's short, it would be a motif enrichment. And the score, um, I limited the E value to be very high because I want to capture the um, short alignments, um, not just the long alignments. So going to... Um, if the sequence is memorized, you can see that um, the alignment length for the generate sequence compared to the training sequence is very short. And um, the test sequence compared to the training sequence are um, somewhat longer. And this 
basically shows that the um, genetic sequence has not been memorizing the um, training sequence. And um, going further, um, testing the genetic sequence against itself and also test sequence against itself. You can see that genetic sequence also have very little alignment um, overlap with um, itself. So there's no mode collapse, basically. Um, the GAN is generating diverse enough samples in which that there is not a significant overlap and just the motifs. For the test samples, um, you can see there are some that falls in within the 500 base pair alignments. This is because um, the forward and reverse complements are all included in the um, blast samples. Um, and that's why there are some reverse complements that has been picked up by the blast. And going to the um, um, sequence composition, um, I'm testing for motif enrichment. So specifically testing for the presence of those regulatory elements and as well as their location of the enrichment. And so I'm using two tools, um, AME, which tests the motif composition from the Jasper database and also um, Centromote, which tests the location of the enrichment specifically. And so what AME does is basically it generates a tumor background negative control. And from there, it tests against the Jasper 2018 database um, for vertebrates. And from there, you get an enrichment off score about the enrichment of those um, motifs in the sequences. And um, with the Fisher's exact test and also adjust the p-value, there are two level of testing that goes in um, to test for the enrichment. And what I found was that the GAN was able to generate sequence with um, very little noise, basically has denoised the input data. And um, there were also motifs that were outlined in the brain data that was also found in the genetic sequence, specifically Neurod1, TCF12, pal 3 3 and so on. And so just to give an example, um, this is the uh, motif enrichment um, from the top sequence of XIT3 type 1 and also genetic sequence um, for XIT3 type 1. And you can see this almost one-to-one -one relationship between the motif composition. So for each dot, it is a motif. And you can see that um, it's 40% present in all of the top sequences and almost 40% present in all of the genetic sequence. So this means that the genetic sequence is um, able to recapitulate uh, most of those uh, motifs that's present in the top sequences. And there are even motifs that are present in the genetic sequence that has not been captured by the top sequence, like LHX1, TCF12, that are outlined in the BIMRAM data. And to go into the motif location, um, I can also see that um, for the top graph, um, it is the um, top sequence for astrocyte. Um, so this is the real sequence. And for the bottom is the genetic sequence. And because the reverse complement is included, you can see that there is this um, kind of um, pattern that's being um, very symmetrical, but it's all, only because the reverse complement is included. And you can see that the motif is um, the highest in the middle and it falls off onto the side. And this pattern is also um, captured by the um, GAN. So if this is like a person's face picture, you can imagine this is, will be the nose and the eyes. And the GAN has generated the nose and the eyes as well. In the beginning, it was just a straight line. And after training, um, it has recapitulated this sequence. And so um, in the future, I'm hoping to maybe um, do some latent space exploration, other single cell type of sequencing. And um, I'm working on a bioarchive paper. And um, just for <laughs> gags, here is a um, info picture of a cat I drew. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, now I will take, take questions. Thanks a lot for Nicole. Uh, thanks a lot, Nicole. That was a very nice presentation. Uh, so yeah, I guess uh, if anybody has a question, you can unmute yourself and ask the question, uh, or you could type it in the chat and I can uh, read it out loud. Uh, but I guess like uh, how uh, like uh, how did you manage to like figure out like the I mean the biggest challenge usually when in neural networks is like how do you figure out like the architecture of the of the network? So have you tried different? architectures uh, and how did you settle on what you have right now? Um, I tried a few variety of architectures um, to go back to the, yeah, um, there were quite a few that can allow you to generate very specific um, category of data. And so I tried a few and um, I am very concerned about stability. 
So I basically try to maximize the stability in terms of um, there's very little failure model and um, try a few different tricks as well um, to make it better. Yeah. Nice. Um, and uh, like how like how feasible is like how scalable is is uh, your architecture in terms of like uh, I guess like yeah like how much data can you give it and like uh, how much time does it take usually to like run on like reasonable data sets or realistic data sets? So um, within a few weeks, it usually reaches um, a good point. But um, if you want to really denoise the data, um, there is actually a stage in which you recapitulate the data and you denoise the data. So if you want to denoise it, you have to train it for a bit longer. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I am fitting on the bigger data set, one Nostra data right now, um, and it's working um, well at the moment. Nice. Uh, we have a question from Maxwell. Uh, a very interesting work. Uh, and what are the applications of the generated sequences? So um, previously, there has been other um, type of neural net that try to generate sequences, but those are usually short, um, very specific sequence like GFP and um, other things. So what I'm trying to do is more to generate sequence that have the motif composition and um, have the motif um, basically patterns. So basically to first, I guess there's denoise and there is also maybe generate more data for um, a certain data set. Um, so there's the standard data set um, generation aspect as well. Um, so there's a lot of directions and this is really just to um, put out the um, cell-specific type of sequences. Mm. Is there, do you think like, I mean, one of the standard issues with, with like neural networks is that uh, they're black boxy, right? Uh, so uh, you might see like in, in the example of the cat image, you can see that it looks like a cat, uh, but like for them, like a generated motif, is there like a biological intuition that you can, that can tell you like, oh, this looks, Re like a reasonable motif generated or reasonable sequence generated? So, um, yes. Um, so I think there has to be, um, I, I recognize that there is a limit in how good the sequence can recapitulate um, biological signals. So for me, I tested for motif enrichment and also the composition of the motifs, which basically tells me if it's able to recapitulate a lot of those important signals for the downstream analysis. Mm -hmm. And um, for interpretation, I'm also working on the latent space exploration. So for the latent space, you can basically kind of compare not just um, where the motif falls in different spaces. Maybe you can also um, compare between different cells. So I'm working on that right now. Cool. So we have last uh, two questions. Uh, so first is from Oriol. Uh, can you use uh, them to generate a sequence that drives expression in a cell uh, type specific manner? For example, for gene therapy applications. I think that's a very interesting um, application that I would like to try. So um, that would require a data set that's somewhat um, promoter specific, I would imagine, for different cells. and. Um, it might not have to be very um, noise free. So it might just be some chip seek or um, transcription factor seek. Um, and that would be very interesting to try, yeah. Cool. And like uh, the last question from, uh, from Michael Huffman, uh, which is following up on the last previous, in the previous two questions, uh, do you think that there are interesting genome editing experiments that you could do uh, to be disrupting the motifs that you've identified? Hmm. Um, I haven't thought about that um, genome editing, but that sounds interesting. So I assume like CRISPR or something like that. Um, I, I guess, yeah. Yes. Okay. Um, so with that, um, I guess you can learn where the genome edit ha happens. Sorry, can you clarify the question? Um, Michael, do you want to chime in? Yeah, I guess I'm thinking, you know, if you de develop, you found all of these um, areas where you think that NeuroD1 or SOX2 are important, you know, have, have you thought of maybe disrupting the NeuroD1 or SOX2 or other motifs through CRISPR editing and seeing what the change in the identified cell types are, are like? 
Um, it was just one idea. I feel like, you know, if you've identified these motifs as having, having an important role in controlling this, this, these lineages you're looking at that, you know, there might be all sorts of experiments you could think of. That's cool. Um, right now, it's just a dry lab experiment, but <laughs> maybe in the future, there can be some um, wet lab cooperation, collaboration um, with um, other labs. Yeah, Great. but that's interesting. Okay, well, thank you so much, Nicole. That was really a, a pleasure to, to watch. Uh, and I guess uh, I'll switch, switch it over to our main speaker, Michael Hoffman, uh, and his talk. Uh, so take it, uh, take it on, Michael. Thank you very much, Ra, and thank you for the, the invitation. So today, I'm going to be talking about identifying transcription factor binding using open chromatin transcriptome and methylation data. Uh, so just wanted to disclose, I have a patent application on cell-free methylation sequencing um, assay, assay result. I'm not going to talk about this data, but I mention this anytime I'm talking about DNA methylation, methylation at all, and you can see all of my potential competing interests on my GitHub. Um, so here, this is something that I adapted from, from Wyeth's um, Canadian Bioinformatics Workshop um, slides, actually, is a uh, model of, uh, oversimplified model of transcription in eukaryotes. So we have a, um, we have a sequence and we have these green parts of the sequence, which represent a transcription factor binding site. It's a transcription factor that binds to the DNA at the binding site. It recruits RNA polymerase II, and the RNA polymerase II produces RNA. And somewhere downstream, the RNA results in function. And I hear there are a lot of other interesting bits of biology between this and, and function and organismal phenotype, and those are all someone else's problem. This right here is a very, um, you know, very challenging problem to solve to try to make predictions of how all of this stuff happens. Um, and one thing that people have used a lot to better understand how transcription factors um, up here on the genome is this technique, ChIP-seq, which I think probably many people here are familiar with, but I'll just, since it's of central importance to the, the rest of the talk, I'm going to briefly uh, summarize it a bit. So ChIP-seq is a assay that you can use to figure out where proteins are present in chromatin. And the way that it works is you have some sort of antibody that is specific to the protein of it that you're interested in. Here, we're interested in P53. You cut DNA into small bits, and then you pull down those bits of the DNA um, that, that have the protein that you're interested in with the, the antibody. And you purify the DNA, and you get a bunch of DNA fragments. So a lot of people are excited about um, what they call next generation sequencing. I actually call it last generation sequencing since you know this is something that dates to, to my PhD days, which is longer ago than I'd like to admit. Uh, so we'll call it high throughput sequencing. Uh, a lot of people are, are excited because you can figure out a lot of genetic variation very quickly, you know? Um, I don't care about that. I love high throughput sequencing because you can use it as a readout for various biochemical or biophysical properties of the genome in a population of cells or individual cells. So the SNTAC, the, the assay that Nicole talked about in the previous talk, that's one example of how you can use sequencing as a readout for, for some property, namely open chromatin. So ChIP-seq, instead we're looking at where these uh, transcription factors or other DNA binding proteins or histone modifications are mainly by looking at where the ends of these DNA fragments map back to the genome, right? And you can convert all of this into a simple map showing how often you find binding or how often you find the presence of each transcription factor at each, at each bit of the genome. And we are going to um, look at that a bit more as we go on. So there are two projects I'm going to talk about in this, in this talk, both done by incredible graduate students in my lab. Uh, the first is a project by Kobe Viner, which is modeling methyl sensitive transcription factors with an epigenetic, expanded epigenetic alphabet. So um, over recent years, people have realized more and more that DNA methylation can play a role in sequence specific 
uh, motif recognition, right? So a lot of individual papers um, of, of key interest is this paper by Hugh and colleagues um, several years ago where they did protein mining microarray experiments and found that if DNA is methylated, um, motifs can actually be quite different from the known consensus motifs in databases like JASPER or, or TransFAC. Um, and then there were other papers like this from the Thai Poly group that did high throughput CLEX experiments showing the same sorts of things in vitro. Another interesting thing that people have been studying in the last few years is these new cytosine modifications. Um, so, you know, they're new to researchers, not new to biology, because of course these have been going on for millions of years. But um, you know, in addition to methylcytosine that many people know and love, there are these further oxidized forms of cytosine like hydroxymethylcytosine and 5-formal cytosine. And there's the possibility that they also play a role in gene gene regulation. So what we wanted to do is to develop a model for um, understanding how transcription factors recognize DNA sequences that included modifications like methylation or hydroxymethylation. And we decided to start with the simplest possible thing that, that might work, uh, which is a strategy I recommend because sometimes it actually works. Uh, often it doesn't, in which case you can go to something that's a bit more complicated. But in this case, we tried the simplest possible thing that worked and that could work, and it seemed like it did work. What we did is we expanded the DNA alphabet from ACGT to adding additional symbols, such as M, meaning a methylated cytosine, right? So M means methylcytosine, H means hydroxymethylcytosine, and so on. Now, when you just have ACGT, you can always figure out what's on the minus strand of the DNA by knowing what's on the plus strand of the DNA. If you are modifying cytosines only, you don't have that anymore. So we actually have to have additional symbols such as one, which means a guanine that is base paired to a methylated cytosine. And then we have things like two and for guanine base pair to hydroxymethylcytosine um, and so on. And then you can also further expand this by adding ambiguity codes like X, which means MRH or, or um, Z, which means any kind of cytosine or modified cytosine. Sorry, I became a Canadian citizen this summer, so I'm supposed to say Z now and I keep forgetting. So Z, Z if it's MHF or, or C. Um, and Kobe wrote some software called Cytomod, um, which takes a genome sequence. So here's a little segment in the mouse genome sequence, and it takes data from say whole genome bisulfite and oxidative whole genome bisulfite sequencing data for a specific cell type and converts this and makes it a cell type specific uh, genome sequence just for this cell type with our expanded epigenetic alphabet. So in this little segment of the mouse genome in these naive T cells, all the CGs are fully methylated. So they all get changed to M1. All right, that's great. How do we, how do we actually use this? So um, the, we, one reason why we decided to use this really, really simple model of making discrete calls of things being M instead of C is it allowed us to use decades of work on, on models for transcription factors, um, including a lot of existing implementations. So we worked with, with Tim Bailey and James Johnson. Tim was the original author of MEME, which also was mentioned earlier today. And Tim and James modified the MEME suite activity, sorry, MEME suite tools mentioned here um, to work with our expanded epigenetic alphabet. And that's actually in the public version. Like you can go to the MEME suite website and you can use an expanded epigenetic alphabet and you've been able to for, for years now. Um, and Nicole mentioned Centrimo. I want to talk a little bit more about Centrimo. Um, I have the privilege of having more time so I can explain it in detail because I want to make sure everyone understands this. So also because Centrimo is a really cool tool, which I, I think is, is underutilized. Um, so Centrimo is a tool for looking at how often you find centrally enriched motifs within some predetermined data set. It's designed with with chip seek data in mind. And the way that Centrimo works is if you have a, a series of query motifs that you're trying to scan along a bunch of regions, the regions are basically chip seek peaks, 
right? You scan each of the regions for each one of the motifs. Like, so let's scan for the red motif. And in each one of the peaks, we'll look for the best match of the red motif. In this peak, it doesn't match at all. And you can do the same thing for the blue motif and the purple motif. Hey, well, the purple motif only matches once. That's not very significant. So we'll get rid of the purple, purple motif. Just look at the red and blue motifs going on. Um, so by taking the place where the, the best matches for the motif within each peak and across several thousand peaks and averaging them together and smoothing, you get something that looks like this. So you align all of these things on either the peak summit peak summits when you have them or centers when you don't. And then you can compare how well things match to the center, right? So what we see here is that the red motif has a really strong central enrichment. The blue motif actually has a slightly stronger enrichment, but it is a little bit off, off center. Um, and usually we try to think of the, um, we try to think of a more centrally enriched motif as a better match between the motif and the chip seek peaks at issue. All right, so we're gonna use a lot of Centrimo, Centrimo results. Um, hopefully people understood that. Um, if not, it's fine because we're just going to boil everything down to a score. We have a number that is going to tell us how centrally enriched a particular motif is. So here's the CAC GTG motif, the well-known EBOX motif for, for MIC. And we have 4,000 chip seek peaks for, for, um, for MIC that we got from this, from this publication. All right, so Centrimo gives us this four times 10 to the minus nine p-value. We take the natural logarithm of that to make the, the math easier. And then we can do the same thing with our modified expanded alphabet version of meme, where we try hemimethylating this, this CG. All right, so we get a different score, minus six here if we're looking at CMGTG. The simple thing that we can do is compare essentially the different hypotheses represented of whether the peaks are, are fit well to a modified or unmodified version of the motif, right? Which is as simple as subtracting the, the log scores. And we can plot it on this little, um, this little scale right here. So if we have a positive score, which are subtracting these two scores from each other, that means that the modified version of cytosine is preferred. And if we have a negative score, that means vanilla cytosine is preferred instead. All right, so for this, for this example, we have minus 19 minus six, which is minus 13, which means that Mick prefers vanilla cytosine, all right? Um, so one thing that some of you have probably been um, wondering is about how we make these discrete calls of whether something is M versus C, because after all, we're using bulk methylation data and it's hard to know, you know, if you get some, if you, you know, get, ambiguous um, results from this, let's say 80% of the reads overlapping a region seem to indicate that something is methylated, but 20% don't, what do you do? Um, so we have to set a threshold parameter here and we don't know how to set the threshold parameters. So we tried every threshold from 1% to 99% at 1% step. And what you see here is that, that score from before, the minus 13, all right, is here on this axis. And that's something that we actually calculated with a 0.7 threshold. So that means roughly 70% of the reads in this region had to support the idea that this particular base was uh, methylated. So we can repeat the same exercise for the other 98 uh, thresholds that we're looking at. And you can repeat it for a number of other different motif pairs. And the result ends up looking somewhat like this. And basically the, the take home lesson for this is it doesn't matter what threshold you look at, 1%, 99%, it doesn't matter which motif you pair you look at, you know, so you can look at the, the G side of things being hemimethylated, the C side being hemimethylated, you look at hydroxymethylation, full methylation. This is always below zero and significantly below zero. Um, so that means the threshold doesn't matter here. It's always, 
is this method is always going to show a preference for vanilla cytosine over over methylated cytosine. Uh, this was you know really interesting to us because um, it matched well with data from the the literature. So in 1991, um, this is the first case I know of someone identifying a sequence specific uh, transcription factor with methylation preference. So this is a paper in Science in 1991 uh, that people did with painstaking in vitro experiments. In 2005, in the more genomic era, people showed the same sort of thing um, with genomic experiments in vivo. Um, and then there's a PNAS paper on that. Um, now, in this decade, um, we can do this without any sort of experiments at all, just downloading data from Blueprint and Encode and using our software. Um, and now we have our results on BioArchive. So it's, it's progress. Um, what kind of progress remains to be seen. Um, so we wanted a control in the other direction as well. Um, so we looked at this interesting protein ZFP57. Um, it's well known to prefer methylated cytosine. We see it's the same sort of results, except everything with a positive score here. Um, so we decided going forward just to use this 0 .7, 0 0.7 threshold consistently, since that seemed to work for everything. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to take this this y-axis, and I'm going to turn it on its side so that things are on the x-axis instead. And the reason that I'm going to do that is that it makes it a lot easier to show a lot more transcription factors at once. Um, so here is this example. This is the minus 13 that I was showing right here. This is MIC. There are 51 other transcription factors um, that I'm going to show you here. This is one of the pairs for MIC. I can show you all of the different motif, unmodified modified motif pairs that we were looking at for MIC. And I can show you all of the other transcription factors where I would be able to if PowerPoint woke up. But PowerPoint wants to sleep. So anyway, let me, well, PowerPoint, Microsoft PowerPoint is not responding. Well, that's not good. Okay, there we go. Um, this is what all of the things, all of the things look like. Uh, Bara asks, why are some of the plots discontin discontinuous for some threshold ranges? That is a good question. Um, let me take you back so you can see what he's asking about. Wow, it's really having trouble with this slide today. I don't know why that is. Um, so essentially, at each threshold, we are only showing the top three most significant um, scores here. Um, and that's that's why, uh, for example, you don't see the, the gold data points like here because they don't fall, they, they aren't one of the more significant uh, results that we're we're looking at. So here it is. Each unmodified motif is compared only to its top three most significant modifications at each special. So it's still there. We just aren't showing it to make the uh, easier to, to understand the the results. Good question. Thanks. Um, okay, so I could go into these um, individual fifty two transcription factors for this mouse data. Um, but that's actually in a preprint from several years ago, so I'm not going to do that. Uh, we're going to switch to my to a model organism instead, my favorite model organism for gene regulation research, which is human. Um, as if you're a wet lab person, human is quite difficult to work with. Uh, but if you're a dry lab person, such as myself, it's great because there's so much data. There's so much data you can just download from ENCODE or a roadmap or, or ICGC, various other other sources. So for example, here there's you know 140-ish uh, transcription factors we can look at in K562 as opposed to the 50-ish we could look at in uh, from mouse and code data. So we can repeat the same sort of same sort of exercise um, with K562 data. Um, and I'll show you some of the results of that right here. Um, so first you know, so, so first, some interesting things we can look at. Um, so I used to like to talk, to say that I, we went from um, from mice to mice two. 
Um, and then this is another Vancouver connection. Allie Carson is like, actually it's pronounced Mace. So I can't say that anymore. But anyway, Mace, Mace Chu um, is a interesting homeobox uh, protein. Um, and it seems like there are some motif pairs. So some motif pairs where it seems to prefer the um, unmodified version, but there are three motifs where it prefers a methylated version, uh, which is quite interesting. Anytime you have any of these things, it suggests there might be additional means of controlling the the regulation of things that are that that you know mace that mace two affects um, or similar for these other transcription factors. E two F six is a four cad box uh, motif, um, which is interesting in that there there has been a dispute in the literature of whether this binds um, methylated or unmethylated motifs uh, from in vitro data. We found that in the data we looked at in vivo, there actually no, there, there don't seem to be any significant examples of, an, of something that looks like a methylated uh, motif. So this shows the sort of, you know, information that you can garner from existing data using our method that people couldn't do using, using targeted experiments. And here's a third, third little vignette, which is about RAD21, which has super, super big, it looks like preference for vanilla cytosine. Uh, question is, do I actually think that RAD21 um, recognizes vanilla cytosine? No, I do not. Um, RAD21, I think, is here because it is a well-known interacting partner with CTCF, just as SMC3 is, and CTCF has a well-known and well-described preference for vanilla cytosine um, in this context. So this is just sort of a, a cautionary tale. Um, you know, this is a correlative method. Um, so I think of it as something that you can use either to examine in vivo hypotheses you know, that, that you have developed um, with in vitro data um, or something that you can use for hypothesis generation that you, you can then tell, uh, that you can then test with further experiments. Um, so with that in mind, uh, I will say that, you know, we've, one thing people, we had a preprint on this a while ago and people were like, why isn't there a paper paper yet? Uh, we actually never submitted the preprint anywhere because we wanted to do some experiments um, which have taken years to get working, but I think we finally have them working. So we've ended up doing some cut and run um, experiments. Cut and run is a technique that works very similarly to, to chip seek in a number of ways, uh, but for, for various reasons, which I could you know, talk about later if anyone were interested. And it, it seems to generate more useful results in certain, in certain circumstances and less, less noisy results. Um, and we have been doing cut and run um, data on a number of different transcription factors. Um, and have been doing these in mouse embryonic stem cells um, again. Um, and one thing that we've been looking at is this important pluripotency um, transcription factor, OCT4. Um, and from the, from the chip seq data and the bisulfite and hydroxy um, methylation data that we have, it looks like they're independent, just like Hugh et al. showed in their eLife paper that, that I talked about at the beginning of this section. It seems like they're independent um, clusters of motifs, some of which, um, some of which these, these little squares that are mostly in blue seem to be um, mostly unmethylated. But there are some that where the DNA is methylated, uh, there seem to be examples of very different, very different motifs. And I'm going to kind of skim over this a little bit. Uh, but basically, I said before that all of this is correlative. What we wanted to do and what we have done is eliminate the correlative nature by using this to design experiments where we do cut and run. And then we follow the cut and run with um, follow the cut and run with bisulfite sequencing or nano HMC seal, which is a way of um, 
differentiating between hydroxymethylcytosine and, and methylcytosine. So what we're going to get in the end are, um, is we are going to find out whether the actual piece of DNA pulled down by the cut and run experiment is methylated or hydroxymethylated or not rather than looking at two totally independent populations of cells and saying that, oh, this appears to be methylated here, and then this other population of cells, the same part of the genome, appears to have transcription factor binding. Um, and these have just kind of come off the, the, the sequencer, but to make a long story short, one thing that we, we have found um, is that in the un unmodified um, context, we seem to find the canonical OCT4 motifs that we expect. Uh, but if you look at the HMC seq data and you, um, we are able to find um, slightly different sets of sets of motifs. Um, and this is doing things in a way where we have actually eliminated all of the um, hydroxymethylation information from the from the motif analysis part of things, but if you add it back in, you can see that this seems to indicate that there might be a slightly different uh, mode of binding of OCT2 of OCT that uses this fully hydroxymethylated motif as shown here. So I hope to be able to tell you more about that soon. Um, so to summarize part one, uh, transcription factors can recognize epigenetic DNA modifications. Uh, our expanded epigenetic alphabet motifs can predict differential binding. Uh, testing modified and unmodified motif pairs can reveal binding preferences. Um, and finally, well, we can find modified versus unmodified motif by partitions. And I didn't talk, talk too much about the methodology behind this, but that's essentially what, I'm what I've been telling you about for, for OCT4. Um, so I see there's a, a question from Oriel in the chat. Maybe I'll answer that and all right, I'll answer a couple of questions and then I'll, I'll go on. Um, so why, Oriel asks, why do you need Centrimo? Wouldn't it be simpler just to compute the proportion of methylated versus unmethylated sites within a window around the peak max? Um, so essentially, the, the mode in which we're using Centrimo, um, we're, actually, we're actually computing those p-values for, um, for fixed windows around the, uh, the peak summit. Um, so in a way that is what we're doing, um, I'm not sure that would have been simpler to sort of roll our own um, solution to this, um, in part because we, we also have the the, the motif recognition part. So it's not just looking at whether there's methylation around the peak or not. It's looking at whether there's methylation specifically at a component of uh, the transcription factor motif, if you will. All right. So we're not just looking for any methylated C. We are looking for in the, say, MIC case, we're looking for only the third position to be methylated rather than the, the first position. Um, Carolyn Brown asks, what about DNA methylation outside of the recognition motif? Yeah, we don't, we don't actually look at that um, specifically. Um, so in general, um, what I think you're getting at is that there's likely to be a run of you know, methylated CPGs within a, within a region and not just at an you know, individual motif. Um, but that's not something we, we look at specifically in any sort of way. Um, let me run on to the, the second part of this. Um, and if you have further questions about the first part, I'll be happy to talk about it uh, again afterwards. Um, so this is work that is done by Miran Krimsadeh, um, who is formerly a PhD student in my lab and is now a postdoc um, working, working with a group at UCSF, um, although working from within, within Toronto in these interesting times. Uh, and this is about predicting transcription factor binding by, by learning from the transcriptome. Um, so ChIP-seq is great. I love, I love ChIP-seq. It's my, my favorite assay. Um, there's a reason that all of the results I showed you before are on um, cell lines or 
you know, blood samples where it's easy to get a lot of cells. And that is because you need a lot of cells um, to do chip seek. Um, so one estimate might be for transcription factor chip seek, you need 1 million to 100 million cells. Um, obviously, it will be less for, for histone modifications. Um, but there are these other techniques that you can use to get information about the uh, biochemical and biophysical context of the genome um, that require far fewer cells, right? So those include DNA seq, um, attack seq. Um, you can also find out other information about the state of a cell generally using things like RNA seq. These are all, you know, much you can do, do them with much smaller numbers of of cells. And I'm at a cancer center, um, and one nice thing about working on cancer is you can usually get samples from from patients, right? So a lot of other diseases, you know, people are going to be reluctant to give up a piece of their, their tissue for scientific research, or it might be considered unethical. Um, in cancer, if, if someone has a, a tumor, they want it out of their body, right? So you, so people can get these things out of the out of the patients. And then if you want to understand, say, how gene regulation works in a solid tumor, um, you have these samples. Um, but you have enough in these samples to maybe do the experiments down at the bottom and not the experiments listed, not the chip seek experiments listed at the top. Um, especially when you consider that there are you know, more than 1400 transcription factors and you would need this many to do chip seek per transcription factor, right? So that's never going to be possible for, for precious human samples and Oh, there we go. It works again. Technology is always fun. Um, by the way, if anyone is interested in um, Cunningham's law, um, some of you I know know this, but the others, um, it, the principle is that the best way to get the right answer on the internet is not to ask a question. It is to post the, the wrong answer. So to make a long story short, I could not get numbers for these things anywhere in the literature or even by asking people directly. Um, so I just made up numbers for first version of this table and posted them to Twitter and asked people what they thought. And everyone's like, you're wrong, you're wrong. You know, I, you need at least 500 cells to do rna seq And well, I did DNA seq with 30 cells once, and that's why you have some weird numbers like 30. Um, so if you, you, know, you wanna join the fray, feel free to, to send me an email and tell, tell me that you can really do whatever assay with, with this many minimum or maximum cells. Okay, so another thing that we need to contend with um, if we are trying to use ChIP-seq to look at, look at things is if you use ChIP-seq as a biochemical readout of the, the presence of, of transcription factors, one interesting thing to realize is that a lot of these cases do not have strong matches um, to the um, to the motif. Um, so, you know, there, there are these great transcription factors like CTCF, I love CTCF, it's my favorite transcription factor because it's it's so well behaved. It's like the teacher's pet of transcription factors. It's so great, like, you know, almost, you know, 85% of the CTCF binding sites have a great CTCF motif, right? Um, CTCF is very exceptional, which is why if anyone shows you some sort of predictive modeling that only works on, you know, and their examples are all CTCF, you should never believe it because all sorts of things work for prediction on CTCF that don't work anywhere else. As you can see here, there's a big drop off after CTCF. There are all these transcription factors for which, you know, there's 50% to 100% occupancy of, of strong matches to the motifs, um, looking at chip seek data from these different cell types. Um, and if you, you know, there's this big set of green transcription factors where it's less than half of the peaks have a good match to the, the, the sequence motifs, all right? And then you have all of these other things um, which, you know, we're calling transcription factors here. And, um, you know, Tim Hughes gets mad at me whenever I do this. So I have to remember they're DNA binding proteins. They're not transcription factors uh, because they don't have a sequence motif, right? So obviously you're never going to be able to predict where EZH2 is just based on its sequence motif because it doesn't have one. 
right? So people have moved beyond just using um, using sequence motifs alone to predict where transcription factors are. You need some other, some sort of other data, such as the attack data shown in the first part of this talk. Uh, people went to what I what I think of as the the um, second generation of transcription factor uh, binding methods, um, of which you know started with this Boyle method and centipede method, and are kind of exemplified by by hint and the way hint works is it combines in something like attack seek data and looks for these wonderful footprints of attack seek data where you have high amounts of open chromatin surrounding a region where there's no upper chromatin a so-called open chromatin footprint and then scans those open chromatin footprints against a collection of motifs from Jasper or wherever. Um, and it does a great job of, of identifying which motif is responsible for binding at these, um, these open chromatin footprints. Um, the only problem is that most binding doesn't occur at open chromatin footprints. Um, so we wanted to move beyond this. And there are basically two things that we decided we could do. One is that we could use experimental evidence from chip seek data and other cell types. All right. So traditionally, the way people think about this this problem of predicting where transcription factors bind is you get training data from um, from chromosomes one through 13, and then you have to predict on chromosomes 14 through 22, right? This is extremely unrealistic, right? I'm not gonna do a chip seek experiment and the, the core isn't gonna call me up and be like, Dr. Hoffman, we lost your results for chromosome 14 through 22. You're going to have to impute them. Never gonna happen, right? So, so we shouldn't be working on this problem. Instead, work on the problem where you have chip seek data from all the cell types you can download and you have a new cell type that you can never run chip seek on because it is too precious. Um, how can we make predictions on that? The other thing we wanted to, to add to models is the association between local transcription factor binding um, and global cellular state as measured by transcribed RNA. Um, and I'll show you here a short little uh, example of how we do this. So here is a segment of chromosome five. We're actually gonna look at four different little independent pieces of it, right? And along the y-axis here are a variety of 100 base pair, 100 base pair windows for which we have chip seek for MIC in these nine different cell types, right? We also, for those nine different cell types, we have RNA-seq data for them all. And we are going to look at the 5,000 genes with the biggest variance and expression over these nine cell types. And we're going to look at these 5,000 genes genome wide. So we aren't looking for, say, um, expression changes that are in cis with the uh, chip seek signal that we are trying to impute. We're looking at the genome wide environment. Um, so the inspiration for this was the, the idea that, you know, say you have some transcription factor and it has zero expression in some cell type. Well, you aren't going to expect to find a lot of chip seek binding um, from that transcription factor in that cell type anywhere, right? Um, so what other things can we learn from the cellular environment or state as measured by um, RNA-seq? So what we do, we have these same nine cell types arranged here and here, and we basically make a big matrix for each of the um, 30, 30 million 100 base pair bins in the genome, looking at these 5,000 genes and seeing whether there is a correlation across these nine cell types between expression of that gene and chip seek signal in this 100 base pair window. Um, and if the p value of this, this Pearson correlation is not significant, we just treat it as NA, we leave it as, as white. If it's positive, we make it magenta. If it's negative, we, we make it orange. Um, and because we are running a little low, low on time, um, I'm not going to go through 
all of the details of how we, after generating this association matrix, um, how we then use that to make predictions. But essentially we turn this into, uh, we look at a new cell type and we look at those same genes that are non-NA and see whether they are correlated or anti-correlated with the association matrix. Right, um, and then you can see in this one very well cherry picked example um, that for GM12878, a, a cell type where there is um, binding of this chip, this transcription factor at this location, we have a positive expression score and in MIC, we have a negative expression score. Um, and wouldn't it be nice if this sort of thing worked genome wide? Um, it doesn't. That's why I'm not spending too much time talking about this, but this is also in our preprint if you want to see the, the, the details of it. This does provide an important signal to, a, to the predictive method that we're going to use, which I'm going to explain to you in a little more detail now. So in addition to expression score, we still have all of that other data that we had before. We have data for how well the sequence at a particular location um, matches the sequence there. We have attack seq or DNA seq chromatin accessibility data. Uh, we have data on whether things are conserved across the genome. And we also have this panel of reference cell type data for chip seq from the same same factor. So how many cell types is is this transcription factor present in at that genomic location? Um, if we actually try to encode the vector of, of which cell type something is bound in, it overfits pretty badly. So instead, we just have the number of cell types. Um, and I like to think of this as telling our model whether something is never bound by a transcription factor, always bound by a transcription factor, or sometimes bound by a transcription factor. You know, which you can see would have a lot of be very useful in making accurate accurate predictions, and yet usually people did not use this information before. All right, so we combine all of this information. Uh, we decided the the novelty really here was in adding the the panel of reference chip data uh, from different cell types um, and the ex oops, I'm pointing at the wrong things this and the expression score. So we decided to integrate all of these different possible things with the simplest possible neural network, which is just a fully connected multi-layer perceptron. And we try a number of different hyperparameters and architectural parameters for, for the multi-layer perceptron, uh, which means we have to, for each, each transcription factor we want to run this on, we need to have at least um, seven cell types, I think, because we, no, I think six, because I think we need three for, um, you know, three or so for training, and then two or so for tuning, and then at least one for testing. Luckily, we have more than that sometimes, because we're working in my favorite model organism, um, human, um, but there you go. Um, since I'm running a little low on time, I'm going to have to um, skip my usual rant about ROC versus precision recall, but feel free to ask later if you're interested in it. Okay, so one thing that we did is we looked at, we make a long story short there, I'm gonna use area under the precision recall curve as a way of benchmarking this stuff. So one thing that we did is we looked at which of these features were important, right? So the reference data from ChIP-seq, expression score, and so on. So for this example, CTCF, the example I told you never to believe anything that you see with CTCF, um, when we get rid of the ChIP-seq reference panel, uh, we, we have a drop in performance. And when we get rid of the expression score, we have a further drop in performance. This is actually fairly indicative of what we see for a variety of other uh, transcription factors that we look like look at, and um, yeah, um, we see these same sorts of things. And basically, uh, the end results is that if we if we exclude chip seek and expression score from our model, uh, we have a number of transcription factors that perform uh, more poorly. Um, if we exclude things like the sequence motif. Sometimes it performs more poorly. Sometimes it performs better, right? So sometimes even having the sequence motif in there can cause some amount of 
um, overfitting. Um, the, the other information that you have on the cell types in question uh, can actually be more helpful. Um, so we decided that, you know, you, incorporating information from other integrative methods like Hint was an important, and again, this is not to say that Hint is not something that is useful. It is to say that we're already including open chromatin data in our model. So adding an additional um, way of, of analyzing open chromatin data doesn't really help very much. Um, so we end up with a big matrix uh, for each, each region, 200 base pair region of the genome, uh, sliding along 50 base pairs at a time. We have some data that is specific to that region and not to a particular cell type. That includes sequence data, that includes which, how many other cell types you find, transcription factor binding, right? And then there's some cell type specific data, which includes things like expression score and chromatin accessibility signal, right? And we can use all of this to, to train, tune, test our performance. Um, and I'm just going to, to give you the top level information about the performance here. There's this small cluster of DNA binding proteins, not all transcription factors, DNA binding proteins for which we do what I, I think is very well on. Uh, you can make excellent predictions on these transcription factors, like not just CTCF, but also things like FOXA1, HCFC1, and so on. Um, there are these, these cell types for which there's kind of middling performance, I think, you know, not something that I'm necessarily going to uh, plan a multi-million dollar experiment based on, but something I would probably look at first rather than, you know, trying to take a, a epigenomic agnostic um, motif only look at which transcription factors might be driving gene regulation in, in a particular region, which lots and lots of people are still doing, right? Lots and lots of people are like, what's going on in this region? Well, look at look at the motifs and, and ignore all of the other information, right? And then there's a then there's a set of transcription factors for which the performance is just not very good. So, um, you know, that's, that's bound to happen for any model. So we don't use this. For the ones for which the performance performance is good. Um, you know, we've, we've made all of our software available, but we actually wanted to make things a little bit more accessible than that. So we actually generated predictions for 33 different tissue types from the remote epigenomics data. Um, and if you go to virtchip.hoffinlab.org, there's this nice little button that you can push that will add all of our predictions to the UCSC genome browser for you. And say you're interested in June D, you can click here. You can turn on predictions for June D in the cell types you like, such as fibroblast of skin of abdomen, if you're a fibroblast of skin of abdomen researcher, um, and then you can view them like this. So here you can see, for example, actual chip seq data, and you can see our predictions of um, our predictions of NRF1 binding at this location and a couple of, of different cell types. Um, all right, so just to summarize this real quickly, using chip seq data instead of modeling transcription factor sequence preference and learning from the transcriptome gives us more accurate prediction of transcription factor binding. Um, we predicted binding of 36 transcription factors for which we had better results in our test data. Um, those are available on our website. Um, there is a preprint um, bioarchive. Please check it out if you're if you're interested. Um, I want to thank especially Kobe Kobe Viner um, who did the work in the first part. Uh, Miran Karimzadeh who's who's not in the uh, who's not in the picture because he has graduated and and moved on. Uh, but thank him for all the work in the second part. I want to thank all of our funders and finally I want to thank all of you for your kind attention. Thank you very much. Um, and at this point, I think uh, Bara is going to moderate any further questions, including the ones that people yeah. have been typing in chat. Well, thanks, thanks a lot, Michael. That was a really, really great presentation. Uh, so I'll start with the uh, Oriol question, which is about by using conversa uh, conservation, aren't novel events unique to human penalized or ignored? Yeah, um, that's a good question, and something that I, you know, I 
I think you you definitely you do not want to be in a situation where you um, are requiring conservation to um, be at a potential transcription factor binding site for you to call it real. Um, that our, our method does not have a hard requirement of, of genomic conservation. It um, just essentially will give things a little bit of a boost um, if there is genomic conservation. So while I don't wanna make that a requirement, I also don't wanna ignore what can be a very useful signal. Um, what this figure shows you is um, which, which features are used to make the the predictions that were that were true positives um, for each one of these uh, transcription factors shown here. Um, so basically, we look at the predictions that are that are made and whether there's a lack of genomic conservation. So for some some of these DNA binding proteins, such as EZH2, Cat2B, um, there are a number of Finding sites that are predicted that have a lack of genomic conservation. Um, you know, it is kind of funny, those are one of the ones we perform uh, more poorly on. So I haven't actually looked at um, in, you know, how important this is. I mean, it's quite possible where this has become very important for those cases where, where we do perform well on transcription factors. So it's a good question. And I do want to like uh, point out that like if people prefer to ask the questions themselves, especially if there's a bit of follow up, like you're more than encouraged to raise your hand or uh, to like unmute yourself and ask. Uh, so the next question is from Alexander Morin, uh, and are the poorly performing transcription factors enriched for known or necessary co-binding patterns? Yeah, that's a that's a good question as well. Um, or or we'll say it's a question I find I find uh, interesting. Um, yeah. So one thing that that we that we notice, um, and I, I haven't done any sort of quantitative analysis of this, um, but it seems that a lot of the things for which we perform more poorly are things that we think. Um, where there is a important cooperative effect of the transcription factor getting to the places that it gets. Um, and the transcription factors, which are more in the sort of pioneer category, we end up over to, to the left. And so for kind of, you know, extreme examples, like let's look at EZH2, uh, which is, you know, and these various other things, which are, which are not transcription factors, um, they don't have a, a motif, right? They're only brought there by interactions with other transcription factors, which probably are gonna change from cell type to cell type and be very hard to predict using this methodology. Um, you see that we can perform very well for things like SMC31 and RAD21, but you know they have a very strong interaction with CT, CTCF, so they, they're kind of an exception to this. But yeah, that's a very interesting question. And I think there is something, you know, a biological difference with some of the things we're able to uh, predict better. Uh, I guess the next question is from Manu uh, Saraswat. And it's uh, how does or uh, does the length of the sequence affect the performance? Um, so I assume you mean the length of the, the motif for the transcription factor. Um, I haven't looked at that, um, but the I don't think the the sequence motif itself is necessarily one of the most important features here. So I I doubt it. Um, we do all the prediction here in um, 200 base pair sliding windows. So there's there's you know no that that you know smooths over other sorts of length issues. Uh, we have also a question from uh, Maxwell. Uh, so thanks for the great talk. Uh, so on the methylation binding project, uh, you could imagine that some of the correlation comes not from sequence preference, but rather from uh, transcription factors driving methylation itself. Do you know which way causality goes uh, for different TFs? Nope, we actually, we, we, we absolutely do not know that. So um, 
yeah, should be very, very careful uh, inferring causality in that direction. How, how do you think you'd like go about trying to figure that like the causality direction here? Um, I mean, I think you would, you would uh, probably have to do some, some targeted experiments, some, you know, genome, genome editing or, you know, some sort of knockdown or knockout knockout experiment. I I doubt it's something you could do just by um, like analyzing existing data. data. Yeah. Uh, we have a, another question from uh, Shems, uh, and it's why was fast cons chosen particularly over something like Philo P or Philo CF CSF? Uh, and I imagine these are other tools. Uh, and yeah. thanks for the talk. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, you know, if we, so what we're looking at again is 200 base pair windows. And I thought that, or rather we thought that fast cons would be better for looking at something where you're looking over a, a window. Um, the planned version 2.0 of this is to work at much higher resolution. And for that, I think we will um, look at something like Philo P. Um, I can't remember the details of Philo CSF, but if it's like Philo P designed to work at higher resolution, uh, maybe we should look at that too. Uh, Victor asks, uh, very interesting uh, talk and thanks for the uh, for the talk, Michael. Uh, I was wondering if you could comment on generally which methylation mark, uh, formal hydroxy or methylated, unmethylated is enriched for transcription factors binding in general? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I'm trying to see if I have some old slide. I have so many bonus slides here, but of course not the one I want. Um, oh yeah, here it is. Um, so one thing, um, I guess I don't have anything answering that question um, directly, um, but there is a fair amount of, of methylation in the genome. Um, it's something that is two orders of magnitude less the amount of cytosine. Um, but then if you're looking at things like hydroxymethylcytosine, there's another you know, bit more than an order of magnitude decrease in the amount of hydroxymethylcytosine you find. And as you go further down that oxidation cascade to formal cytosine and carboxyl cytosine, um, you find even less. So it gets, it gets hard to make sort of genome-wide conclusions of things beyond the hydroxyl stage, unless you are working in a, um, unless you're working on a sample that has, has you know, artificially increased the number by um, uh, interfering with the, the repair pathways that get, get rid of things like formal, cy formal cytosine. Um, so it's hard for me to answer that question for F or C. Um, for the most part, what we find is that uh, transcription factor binding motif, sorry, binding locations are enriched for unmethylated, unhydroxymethylated cytosine for most transcription factors. Um, so, you know, to, to me, that makes a lot of sense. You have to remember that for the transcription factor, um, you know, it doesn't see the difference between methylcytosine and cytosine the way that we do as a different layer of information that's inherited a different way to the transcription factor. It's just, it's this functional group sticking out into the, the major groove or not. And it makes quite a lot of sense that a methyl or hydroxymethyl um, could interfere with a transcription factor that was not selected to interact or with it directly in the way that say ZFP57 was. Cool. Uh, I, I think I have a, also a question of my own, which is, do you think that like, uh, like now we're starting to get more data uh, from direct RNA sequencing, especially from like Oxford Nanopore, uh, mm -hmm. where you're, you're not, you don't have to go through like roundabout ways of like bisulfite uh, treatment or something like this. Uh, do you like your, what are your priors on like, is this gonna change some of your conclusions? Uh, Especially maybe I guess like for the first beginning, like first part of your talk. 
Yeah, um, it certainly it certainly makes collecting the the data um, you know easier and more interesting. Um, you know the the thing. Things like Oxford Nanopore, they have their their strengths in that they can be cheap. They can, um, you know, easily generate really long um, sequences. Um, but you know, for for the time being, for the sorts of assays that I'm interested in, things like chip seek, um, I believe using Illumina sequencing is going to generate a lot more individual reads, which is what you generally want more of rather than say, than say long reads. Um, so for the sort of integrated uh, chip or cut run uh, by sulfide or HMC seal stuff, I'm not sure that's going to change. What might change is that if you already have um, validated models, people will be more easily able to get, um, you know, whole genome methylome data using things like Oxford, Oxford Nanopore, and then you can apply these sorts of models to them. So it doesn't change things for me, but maybe change things downstream. Mm -hmm. It's a long, short version. Uh, there are two more questions. The first is from uh, Aliriza, and could you please comment on CTCF and methylation as well? Uh, are you seeing a preference in binding based on the methylation levels? Yeah, so we definitely see, you know, most of what we see in terms of CTCF is that it is binding to uh, regions where there is not DNA methylation. All right, and this is actually the, the single strongest effect we see in, in either direction is CTCF really, really prefers, really, really prefers vanilla cytosine. Um, so, you know, again, remember the, the example I showed you at the beginning, uh, something that was a validated preference for unmethylated cytosine had a score of minus 13 CTCF some motif pairs have a score of more than minus 15,000, right? So it's big, <laughs> big preference. Okay, so I guess we'll take the last question before like uh, stopping the recording and opening space if people want to ask more informal questions about the presentation itself or about your work in general. Uh, so the last question is from Alexander Morin and it's, uh, I apologize for the naive or maybe na nebulous nature of this question, but could you reverse the workflow of the first part of for regulators like uh, MECP2 that don't have a canonical motif, but differentially bind to C CPGs? Uh, in effect, discovering DNA, mo DNA motif, uh, sequence, DNA sequence that may help explain differential methylation and therefore MECP2 binding patterns. Yeah, that's an interesting question. Um, so as I mentioned, there were many parts of the meme suite that were adjusted to work with the expanded alphabet, yet most of the results I showed you are from um, Centrimo. So the, the things that have been modified include meme and dream and, and stream, which is I think of as the next generation of dream, uh, which do de novo motif discovery. Um, we haven't actually found a lot of, we, we didn't, we've been looking essentially, but nothing has ever popped up, popped out for us as examples of interesting de novo motifs, which is the sort of thing I think you, you know, might see if you were trying to answer that question. Not, not that things would be de novo per se, um, but that you would do, Get a de novo discovery that would, you know, maybe match some other pattern that people were were known about. So it's a good question. Um, it just we haven't seen much of things in that direction. We kind of have targeted our own analysis towards more of this centrimo hypothesis testing uh, mode of operating. It's a, it's a good question. <laughs> it just hasn't. I don't think it's worked out that way. Awesome. Well, uh, thanks, thanks again, uh, Michael and Nicole, for the great presentations. And uh, I mean, I truly hope that like uh, 
next uh, opportunity, it will be here in Vancouver in person, uh, and we'll get to go after this and go eat pizzas. Uh, but sounds good. Uh, yeah. So with that, I'll thank everybody. Thank you everybody for attending, and I'm stopping the recording.